That was awesome, man. We just talked with Or and Or Shilon for those who want the full name. He's one of the ML platform engineers at Lemonade. What'd you think of the conversation, Vishnu? I thought it was great. I thought it was, it's, you know, it's always rare, I think, to find the kind of person who is both in the weeds as a talented individual contributor, but also has to think strategically about company and business mm -hmm. needs, right? Usually those kinds of people are either are plucked very quickly to the top or are off doing their own thing nowadays, right? Yeah. Um, it, and it was cool to see someone like Orr who has stuck around at Lemonade for a while and has really pushed uh, the kinds of ML platform infrastructure that you know I think a lot of companies would love to have. And it was a yeah. great conversation. That's true. Like when he was explaining the platform that they have, and basically the conversation that we have coming up for you right now is centered around how Lemonade created their platform and what it looks like and what are some things that they keep in mind, this platform thinking mentality. And when he was talking about it, I just kept thinking like, wow, this is pretty advanced. This is cool. Like, I hope this becomes the standard as, oppo as opposed to like the exception. And so hopefully when everyone's listening to it, you get uh, some good feedback or some good nuggets of wisdom that you can bring into your job. Uh, and I wanted to mention something else, man. There's some things to call out. He was with one other platform engineer serving 20 data scientists. That's pretty incredible at some point. Now the team has since grown to four, but two to 20 is, uh, yeah, one platform engineer for every 10 data scientists. That's a pretty, pretty big one. Uh, and then they have a Slack bot that they can train different yeah. models with. They have a Slack bot that they can like push models to production with. That's pretty wild too. I've never heard of that. Yeah, the, the emphasis on automation and platform thinking and efficiency was pretty impressive to see because you don't get yeah. that level of leverage in terms of two people being able to support that many people uh, very often unless you've made long-term investments in the efficiency and productivity of those people uh yeah. and so true. the fact that they were able to do that shows that they have really done that uh for a long period of time and with a lot of vision and it's a i i think everyone listening will learn a lot about how if you make the right kind of investments up front over time they can really pay off in terms of efficiency there's one thing that I wanted to point out, and we were chatting on Slack while he was talking about this. He goes over their five different like pillars of their ML platform. The first one he talked about was how they built their own feature store. And it reminded me of when Jesse was on here, like what, a week ago or two weeks ago. And Jesse was talking about this conundrum that a lot of these companies who started doing ML early, they have. And it was exactly the narrative that Jesse laid down for us. And if you haven't right. listened to the conversation with Jesse, go back and listen to it. It was a fascinating one. Not a lot of people, I don't, I'm surprised why it didn't get as many views at, or listens as I thought it would, because the conversation with Jesse was just incredible. But I think we must have messed up on the title or something. People weren't clicking <laughs> on it. It's called scaling biotech. So people probably thought like, well, I'm not in healthcare. I'm not doing anything with biotech. So it doesn't apply to me. Jesse had amazing wisdom. Uh, and so I highly encourage you to go listen to that. But the premise of it was, and what Jesse talked about was how these companies, they start building their own tools internally because there is nothing on the market, but then, mm -hmm. and they all start doing that around the same time because they start seeing the need and there's these bottlenecks that are happening. So everyone's kind of building their, the same internal tools, say like a feature store, we can use that. Cause that's like the canonical example, but it's not just for feature stores. A lot of them like monitoring or uh, deployment platforms, we can use any of these, but what happens is, is that Uber's building their Michelangelo and they have a feature store and then they spin it out and it becomes right. Tekton. And Orr was talking about how they were building a feature store and it's the same thing. Like they, they have this problem now because Tekton wasn't out before they started their, their whole journey on a feature store. But now it's so customized. Their feature store at Lemonade is so customized to their needs that he was saying, I have a really hard time see, 
seeing us go out and buy something off the market because we have something that is so customized to what we do. We're just going to keep doing it. And Jesse was talking about that too. Like he called it exactly how it was. And that's what I really appreciate the conversation with Jesse more after hearing or talk about this. But anyways, I think we've talked enough about what you're going to hear and just get into the conversation with or right now. Any last thoughts from you, Vishnu? Real quick, do you want to just go through his bio, read it out? I'm happy to do it just so oh, that everybody probably, gets a sense yeah. of what he does. Yeah, so, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yeah, let me do that real quick. So or or Shalon is an ML engineering team lead at Lemonade, currently developing a unified ML platform. Trust me, it's really cool. His team's work aims to increase development velocity, improve accuracy, and promote visibility into machine learning at Lemonade. Previously, Orr worked at Twiggle on semantic search at Veronis and at Intel. He holds a BSc in computer science and psychology from Tel Aviv University. Or also enjoys trail running and sometimes races competitively. Last thing before we jump into the full conversation. We're looking for people to help us edit these videos. Basically, you don't have to know anything about editing. You just got to tell us where the nuggets are, where the gems are in these conversations so that we can trim it down and get like a 10 minute highlight reel for people to watch on our MLOps clips secondary channel. If you're interested in that, because we can't hire a producer, you're probably thinking, well, get somebody that's actually like a pro at this. The problem is that producers and podcast producers or video producers, they don't understand machine learning. And so they don't know what's a gem and what's just like uh, us talking and it's not that cool. So if somebody yep. out there who is knowledgeable in this space and passionate and a listener wants to help out, we would love some volunteers. And that's it. Let's get into the conversation. Hey, Demetrius, how's it going? What's up, man? I'm stoked to be here. As always, we've got another incredible guest. What's going on, Or? Hey, man. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on, Or. We're really excited to talk about ML Platform at Lemonade. You know, it's. I'm excited to hear more about what the company does, how you guys have built the team you have, and, and, and get to learn from you in terms of really what this really fast growing and hot company in a very interesting industry is doing from an ML platform standpoint. So to kind of kick things off, can you tell us a little bit about what Lemonade does and what your ML platform team at Lemonade is supporting in terms of use cases? Uh, sure. So Lemonade, I'll start off with Lemonade a little bit. Uh, Lemonade is a full stack insurance carrier. Uh, and I guess we're sort of like powered by AI and uh, social good. Uh, but we do basically four kinds of insurance. Uh, the first is like PNC insurance for homeowners and renters. Second would be like pet health insurance. The third is life insurance. And the fourth is uh, we recently launched car insurance. Uh, and so we do this in mostly in the United States, but in several countries in Europe as well, uh, depends on which kind of insurance. And like I mentioned before, we're a full stack insurance carrier, which means we're not like an aggregator. We actually are the underlying insurer. Got it. And, yeah. you know, it's funny. I'm actually a Lemonade customer. So I, oh, I cool. uh, yeah, I'm from my, uh, so from you're highly biased. New York City. Yeah, definitely. That's, what, That's great to hear. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with the product. And uh -huh. with that in mind, I, so you guys are full stack insurance carrier. You have all these different lines. Where does machine learning fit into what Lemonade does? Why do you need machine learning? So I would say it's sort of like for, it's on this uh, like line with tension between two different things. The first would be like improving the product. So we want to improve our users, uh, our users' lives by improving the product. That would be something like maybe, uh, I don't know, doing intent prediction for a chatbot uh, for customer service before you actually reach a customer. Like if you, you could probably handle something before reaching a representative uh, or maybe doing things like other things automatically for customers. And then the second kind of big, uh, big chunk would be trying to improve our business with things maybe like predicting lifetime value for users, things like that, uh, which are, you know, can be done in any business. That makes perfect sense. It's, I think, always helpful for us to set the context for why machine learning is a part of the business. And with that in mind, I have, you know, seen 
from the outside a little bit, you know, how this business has grown and also even just like how ML engineering at, at Lemonade has grown, you know, from the job posting you guys have, and from the descriptions of your platform that I see online and talks. Can you tell us a little bit about what the end to end process from of going from data to model and production looks like at Lemonade on your ML platform? Yeah. Uh, so the platform sort of provides uh, what we call point in time data, or it basically provides data uh, on our data warehouse directly in Snowflake. Uh, and if researchers want to do maybe exploratory data analysis, they can do that directly on the data warehouse on this like on these giant dimension tables with hundreds of features uh, that have already been created for them, or they can do it on raw data. Uh, I think at this point we have maybe 1500 features in our feature store. So we're at the point where hopefully uh, researchers will be able to like not, uh, not have to create features for new models or maybe have to create only several. Uh, and then they'll start there. Uh, they'll do their modeling in a notebook. And then uh, like the most important step for us is that uh, we translate uh, we translate modeling code both for training and for inference into our like internal platforms framework, uh, which kind of democratizes training. So anyone can kind of train anyone else's model. Uh, we have a Slack bot to be able to train models uh, with cloud resources. So we can kind of run training there, configure, uh, configure like uh, periodic training as well. That's super cool. Yeah. And uh, then finally, they'll use that same Slack bot to deploy a uh, service to production since we usually do online inference. Uh, and then that service will be exposed to like developers, which will integrate with it at Lemonade. And finally, uh, we use a third party for monitoring. We use uh, Aporia, which I think alone has been on here at least once or twice. Uh, and I think what we've learned over time is that we really want our data scientists to uh, to manually configure monitors for their machine learning models. Like we don't want anything automatic out of the box so we don't get like this alert fatigue. And it's something that needs to be constantly tuned all the time. Like, so they'll configure both their like uh, their data drift monitoring, concept drift monitoring and the performance drift monitoring as well. Uh, with sort of like these very specific alerts per feature uh, in order to be able to monitor something that like that matters. We want like high high precision, even if the recall isn't that great. Can, can we double click on that real fast? Because I'm wondering how much of this, as you said, some of the stuff like the features you can recycle. And then when it comes to the monitoring, how much of that has to be custom or bespoke every time or how much can you recycle? Uh, so, I mean, like I mentioned before, we hopefully recycle very many features. Uh, we have dozens of models running in production with like it, each one of them has dozens of features. So we definitely recycle uh, features. And then we actually have several kinds of monitoring. We'll monitor features like separately from models uh, we'll kind of monitor maybe the amount of null values. We'll monitor if features are equal between training and inference time. This is like the feature store. We'll do it completely separately from with, if a model even uses the feature, uh, and then model monitoring, like features within models are, we had a time where we did a lot of like, uh, Auto, we tried to do like auto monitoring to take this burden off of data scientists. Uh, and we kind of reached the conclusion, at least at this point in the platform, that we're not able to provide that service like in a very good way. So we're at the point where data scientists will like manually configure monitors per feature for a model. And that's like part of our process of reaching production and then They'll get these alerts in Slack and whatever, but and, but that's like a big part of the process of reaching production. And then we do these iterations once in a while where we go over the monitors, like we make sure that everything's up to par and everything like that. 
how did you guys decide on a Slack bot as being the right way to, to have this model training process work? Yeah, actually, the Slack bot is really intriguing, isn't it? That's the, probably the first time I've heard like about a Slack bot bring, being brought into the whole MLOps equation or like just training and machine learning equation in general. So I, I think I'm lucky enough to be working at an organization where automation is like top priority. And so this the Slack bot, there's like a laminate Slack bot with blog posts about it. It's called Cooper, like from Sheldon Cooper. Uh, and it's really easy to integrate with this platform, like the Slack bots platform. Uh, so it's kind of like standard lemonade practice to do things with the Slack bot. Uh, and so we kind of have our, like our own service and our own commands that integrate with this platform and do a bunch of different things. So maybe we'll have commands to bring up a SageMaker notebook or take it back down. We'll have commands to maybe remind people that their notebooks are up so we don't spend a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we'll have commands for like managing the machine learning lifecycle, for training models with cloud resources, for deploying them, for taking things down. Uh, I guess several other small pieces. You said something really interesting there that I would like to dive deeper into, which is automation is a top priority at Lemonade and that you're fortunate to work at an organization that does that. Why do you think automation is so important to Lemonade in particular. What is it about the company that makes you guys want to really prioritize that? And why do you feel like you're lucky to in that context? So I think we prioritize automation uh, from a business perspective. Like one of the top metrics that we try to look at is maybe the amount of customers that we have per employee or the amount of uh, ARR, or we call it IFP, per employee. Uh, that's like a very important metric that we look at. So automation is like a big part of the company. Uh, and I think I'm lucky to work at a place like that because it makes it, uh, I guess it's a priority for everyone to automate things, which is really nice things. Like then we have cool things like Slack bots, which deploy machine learning models or train machine learning models. That's Really interesting to hear that you guys actually apply almost business level metrics to what is usually considered just a, a technical imperative of automation. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times when we talk about, you know, automation mindsets and such at different talks and, and podcasts that we've been in, it's mostly with like, well, how do you automate more so the engineering team can be more efficient internally and mm -hmm. can kind of, you know, get rid of bottlenecks. But to hear that it's such a business focus that trickles down into everything you guys do. I think that's a very unique approach that clearly yields some pretty interesting results. Like the Slack bot that serves, it seems like a lot of customers in the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And All I right. want to know, like when you're looking at that automation side of things, what are some points where it's gone wrong? Like it has not gone wrong per se, but just where you tried to automate something and shouldn't have been automated. You mentioned the monitoring before where you tried to take that to the automation step, but then you had to dial it back. Has there been a point where the Slack bot was trying to be implemented and you realized, whoa, actually it's not, it's not the best use case for a Slack bot. We need people to be doing this. Uh, I don't think I've seen, I guess maybe not all Slack commands that end up being implemented are utilized a hundred percent. I don't think I've seen metrics on it, mm. uh, but I, I don't think I have a really good story there. I, I think like a great story is like we talked about, uh, about trying to automate machine learning monitoring and kind of failing there, uh, just sort of having like low precision, high recall, uh, and having, you know, dozens of alerts a day w without anyone being interested in them. Uh, and that's how you knew this isn't working. It's like, wow, yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone kind of knew you. that it wasn't, that it wasn't working for us to, to kind of configure monitors automatically. Yeah. Okay. Last question about the Slack bot and then we can move on, but it's just so fascinating to me. Is there someone that is looking at metrics on which commands are being used with the Slack bot? Like, do you have a team that 
just babysits the Slack bot and decides what to put in there? Uh, I think there's a, there's maybe a person, uh, it definitely doesn't babysit the Slack bot. It's a platform. So like technically they don't even know the commands that, uh, that we've written to like wow, integrate okay. with this platform. Like, uh, <laughs> I said I'm lucky enough to work at an organization that has like automation key. So platforms is something else that's like really big. Uh, so decentralizing development in every sort of way is also a big priority. That is fascinating to hear. I think with that in mind, I want to ask a little bit more about what tools you guys use in the context of your you know, ML development stack. You mentioned Snowflake. You mentioned Notebooks. Are you using any enhancements on top of Notebooks? Any kind of managed service? You mentioned Emporia. We'd just love to kind of hear what your tool universe looks like. So, I mean, uh, I think you guys have seen at least this uh, blog post by Ernest Chan where there's like five main building blocks. So maybe I'll describe kind of each building block that we have. That'd be great. Uh, so we have an internally implemented feature store. Uh, we kind of started before Tekton uh, was public or before they exited stealth mode. Uh, and it were the feature store is so customized towards our specific needs that I'm having a really hard time like seeing how we can kind of use a, any other party that even though like people are developing things that are much better and much more comprehensive, uh, we have some like super specific needs on our very specific like data and use cases. So we have an internally implemented feature store. It's implemented in Python. Uh, it has it uses like different uh, th there are different contexts that it runs in. It does uh, it, it reads streams with Lambda with like AWS Lambda. Uh, it runs like it serves real time features from a Kubernetes service. Uh, with the fast API framework, we recently ported like all of our code to asynchronous uh, to like an event loop, uh, which has been like a very successful for us in terms of uh, model serving latency. Uh, the online feature store is backed by DynamoDB, and the offline one, like I said, is backed by Snowflake. Uh, and then we also run like different ETLs uh, over Kubernetes as well, uh, and the workflow management that we use is Airflow, which is all, also does like our uh, periodic training if we need, and then it'll also manage like the different ETLs if we want to do batch ingestion into the feature store. Uh, we use MLflow both for experiment tracking and as a model repository. Uh, and we're very heavy on like uh, infrastructure as a code. So, uh, so we don't use like the MLflow feature where uh, there's like a model, a production model, maybe like a, a blue-green deployment or however they do it there. We actually li literally take the model ID and stick it in our code, like in Git. Everything is versioned in Git uh, at Lemonade. Like all all provisioning code is, is versioned in Git. Uh, so like I said, we're very heavy on platforms and uh, like decentralizing development. Um, yeah, so I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to keep describing different building blocks, but I'd love to hear a question. Well, I mean, I I'm just sitting here as an engineer and I'm kind of like, well, you have all these different sort of nicely, you could say configured or architected building blocks, right? It's pretty clear to me how you guys have solved all the different sort of natural friction points that a lot of other companies, including my companies, have faced in building and productionizing machine learning models and then also monitoring and maintaining them in production. So what are the areas of friction that still exist? I, I'm, I'm curious in terms of maybe your tool selection or just in terms of putting more ML models into production. Uh, I think maybe... The biggest challenge we face in general is like a people challenge. Uh, so mm. it, the market is very hot, like for employees at the moment. And yeah, and I think we try to solve problems that 
we want to like enable data scientists from all different backgrounds to be able to use this platform. And that's still our biggest challenge, like enabling people that have only ever delivered notebooks to uh, reach production. And at the same time, enable data scientists to have been like software engineers for 15 years and are very opinionated on frameworks uh, and would like to do everything, you know, want to know what's going on under the hood. And, and we sort of keep like the, the interfaces that we provide is really the biggest challenge. It's not like the underlying code. Uh, it's really deciding on those interfaces and keeping them current and having them work for everyone uh, from like the least experienced to the most experienced. Wow, I, I love that. And I love hearing about how this spectrum, you're serving this whole spectrum from the data scientist who has been only a data scientist and loves Jupyter Notebooks and doesn't want anything to do with anything else. And then the data scientist who is transitioning from being in the software engineering world and is very opinionated. I'm thinking about when you're opinionated like that, or you as the platform person, you have to ultimately make some decisions and you have to be opinionated, opinionated about some things. Like how does your choice, how does that look? And do you go and are you surveying the different users of the platform or is it something that you just say, all right, we, we can't let this happen anymore because we've seen the downstream effects. So I think we're kind of at the point where we've gone full circle. It's kind of uh, weird. We started with something that was very open. Uh, and then like our second version of our model serving framework, which is like the main area where data scientists work, like the model training and serving framework, uh, where they'll sort of implement an interface basically to like fit a model and to predict on the model uh, and give a list of features. So that framework was very open in the beginning where you could sort of make all these different decisions. Uh, then the second version was kind of closed where it was really good for 80% of the use cases, but did not work very well for about 20%. And we've kind of like gone for a full circle in the way that we can, we sort of allow both at this point, but there's nowhere in the middle. Uh, so some people will kind of make all of these decisions about where their features come from and like specific queries. And they'll maybe like write custom queries to bring their, their uh, features from Snowflake in a custom way, but they'll kind of have to take responsibility for that. And others will just like provide a list of features and it all happened for them. I think your statement about how you think about your platform work really is the clearest articulation I've seen of the sort of customer mindset that has to happen for platforms and internal platforms to work. Where you're saying, you know, you mentioned the hardest problem I have is not picking the tools, it's not setting up the architecture, it's really figuring out what my customers need in the form of data scientists and it's designing those interfaces thoughtfully enough that I'm serving all their needs without making my work impossible to do. And I think that is like the central challenge that we talk about so much on this podcast. Um, it's kind of fun to hear that framed really well, elegantly by you in, in your example. And I, uh, Vishnu, sorry to interrupt there, but another no, point that I wanted to add was that it sounds like, or what I understood too, is that if you make a really cool platform that someone can have a great time using and these data scientists enjoy using, you're going to be able to attract better talent because they enjoy using the platform. They enjoy the problems that they're working on. Is that another piece of it? Or did I just make that up in my head? So I, I think that's a big piece of it, of having people. Um, I like to talk about ownership a lot uh, and we're, like, uh, like, I think it's quite obvious from the way that I've described the platform that we're not a throw it over the fence kind of team where data scientists have ownership end to end. Uh, and it attracts a certain type of data scientist, but I think that's, I think maybe people that have worked on teams that are, were like throw it over the fence have experienced the frustrations uh, on like both sides, both with like different ownership models and lagging delivery. Uh, and I think that's like something that's very important to us. Uh, having this like clear ownership, there are obviously like gray areas in the middle, but 
there there's clear like engineering ownership and clear data science ownership and data and scientists just, will write the code that runs in production and that's so important to us do they get the call also at three in the morning if something goes wrong they're tagged in slack yeah <laughs> like they're they're auto tagged on their models yeah. <laughs> Cooper's letting them know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, That's awesome. So I mean, we're definitely auto tagged on more things, but uh, they they do get tagged on uh, different types of alerts on their models, whether it be like applicative alerts, just like exceptions, or uh, data and concept drift, or null features, things like that. Going back to something you said before about the people challenge and hiring in general, and this in this in this job market, this global job market that we now, you know, really are experiencing. Can you tell us as a team lead, what parts of the hiring process are, are so hard right now? Is it finding qualified candidates for this type of work in terms of ML platform and the combination of software, data and machine learning, or is it closing on candidates? What, what are the, some of the challenges you're facing? So l like you said, I, I'll speak only to challenges on like specifically machine learning platform engineers. Sure. Um, I think I'm having, uh, I think we're having more trouble like closing qualified candidates. Definitely the pipeline, like the candidate pipeline is not what it was uh, two years ago. Like I see much, much less candidates and we have to like, Interesting. Uh, I don't know, uh, approach them more than they would approach us. Like Lemonade's mm. engineering brand is quite good. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. And I also think this is like a very interesting role in general, building a machine learning platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet we're still having to approach candidates at this point in time, whereas before, like we didn't have to at all. I, and I have I'll, a theory about that just, uh, before you, I'd love to hear, I think it's, I think it's because you know what I think it is, is there are so many new startups that are just getting an influx of cash. The amount of VC money that's going into all of this stuff that has to do with machine learning. And now these machine learning engineers are being brought on to all of these different startups. And maybe they're the first engineer at, for the machine learning platform, or they're being tasked with a lot of responsibility for them, for all of these different, all this talent that's out there, there's a lot of opportunity, right? And so the reason I think if you go back uh, a notch as to why there's so many job openings for machine learning engineers, it's because of that, but like, the amount of VC money that's going into all of these startups that have anything to do with machine learning or using machine learning in their product in the day in like the core piece of the product uh, has just gone up drastically. And so that's why it feels like there's not enough talent out there, but that's, that's my theory. I no, portable. I completely agree. Like two years ago, there were maybe five like tech unicorns in Tel Aviv and now there's 50. Wow. <laughs> I mean, Tel Aviv, I know Tel Aviv is a boomtown. It's really cool to see, but I did not know the scale was that, you know, massive. Yeah. So there's uh, like, there's a lot of VC money being poured in at the moment or there, that, I don't know what's going on specifically like now, now, but mm -hmm. uh, in the past year there was. Yeah. You're seeing the repercussions of it now. Yeah. You're seeing people that have taken jobs maybe three months ago or five months ago because they got the VC money a year ago and now they finally found someone to take that machine learning engineering position. And so it's harder to find those people. But uh, Vishnu, I know you had a question that I cut you off or, or sorry, I cut you off with that theory. Like, tell us more <laughs> if you can remember what you were talking about. Well, yeah, go ahead, go ahead or. Oh, no, I was going to continue like with the building blocks, but this conversation is more interesting. No, I mean, I think I think. I think the one last question I had before maybe we can jump back to the to the building blocks piece is, you know, you've described a really interesting process in terms of like what N10 ML looks like at Lemonade. What, how many people do you have on your team right now? And how many people do you support? Like, what does that org chart and sort of headcount look like? So we're currently four people on our team uh, and we support like just over 20 uh, data scientists. And I think like one of the things that I'm most proud of is that there were several months where we were two people supporting uh, over 20 data scientists, which kind of like, I, I'm, I'm really proud of the, 
like the engineering to data scientist ratio that we've had there. And we still kind of managed to compartmentalize all of this like from the organization. Uh, and I think it's like, it's a big part of the platform thinking at Lemonade and the way that even like our DevOps organization has exposed building blocks for us to use. And the simplicity of us being able to like get up and running with anything open source, uh, even within like a quite like a medium to large size organization at this point. That is, first off, I'm glad to hear number one, what you're proud of, because I think that that is always uh, an interesting sort of lesson in terms of what you're a team lead, right? You're a leader on, on your, on your platform and your company and it's always interesting to hear what leaders celebrate right it tells you about their value so that's cool and number two two people supporting 20 data scientists for a company of lemonade size um and you know just customer base that's that's pretty remarkable and it does speak to the quality and the vision behind your engineering and operations internally that's that's really awesome to hear yeah man like we're really kind of standing on the shoulders of giants uh both you know uh, cloud computing in general, and then like Lemonade's infrastructure uh, above that. I'm glad that people are getting to hear this, hear about this as, as at the, uh, through this podcast, because, you know, I, I work in the healthcare sector, you know, I work at early stage startup. And I think for us in, in, in the industry that we're in, in healthcare, there's a lot more sort of, we deal with a lot of administrative bloat in the U.S. healthcare system, right, as, by design. And there's not as much emphasis on efficiency and there's not as much understand, understanding almost philosophically of the power of leveraging tools and infrastructure to make one person the equivalent of two people five years ago. And I think industries and companies like yours are really showing the way to people like mine where I'm, an, I'm, I'm sort of a first I've been a first machine learning engineer hire or first data scientist hire. And I look to companies like Lemonade or Pinterest or, or companies like that are a little bit further along in industries where that level of efficiency and, you know, infrastructure leverage, I guess you could call it, is is prized. So thanks for sharing that. <laughs> infrastructure leverage. That's a new one. I like that. We might have to coin that. I don't know, I don't know if that's... I don't know if that's quite the word that we're verbiage I want to go with, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep that there for now. Well, let's so, talk for a minute about the, uh, the other building blocks that we like kind of cut you mm -hmm. off and we derailed, we went on a little bit of a tangent. And so we got to the first two, right? Like the feature store and then ML flow, but there were three yeah. more that you mentioned. So I also mentioned the airflow is like training orchestration. Uh, and then the, I've kind of mentioned monitoring beforehand, uh, which we use Aporia. And the final one is model serving. Uh, so we have this like internal model uh, training and serving framework, which I also sort of ended up discussing uh, that the interfaces there are like some of the most important things that we, that we handle. Uh, and there's like a set of methods that if, they're implemented, then we get like the platform will guarantee a bunch of things like a highly available service and uh, different, several different types of monitoring. Uh, I, I mentioned before that we have like you use applicative monitoring and then like sp generic monitoring of features. And then we have like specific for specific mon monitoring for like data drift and concept drift. Um, we'll get like alerts on those things. Uh, CICD, you know, all these engineering guarantees uh, if we implement this set of interfaces. Uh, we'll also get batch uh, inference out of the box, uh, which is kind of nice if people just want to go and like do batch inference on this model, even though it's an online model. And there's something that has been coming up quite a bit recently with the MLOps community, not only in Slack, but also on the people that we have on. And it's all centered around testing and how to do testing for ML and specifically like, what kind of things do you look at? How have you guys cracked that nut? So I would say that's still one of the biggest challenges that we have ahead of us. Um, I mean, on the data side, we, we do testing, uh, like since we have a feature store, we're able to do testing 
of feature unification, like features, even, the, even if they're uh, generated from different sources, will still be able to test that they're correct in it, like inference versus training. Uh, but on like the model side, I would say we're, we're still at a manual phase uh, in this process. Like it's still something that's done in notebooks. Yeah, that's, that's a really classic one. And it, I feel like that's probably why like, we put out a few videos on testing recently and they've gotten a ton of traffic. And I think it's just because most people are hitting that bottleneck right now. And they're saying, <laughs> how do I do this? What are some best practices? Who can I learn from? There's not a lot of literature out there when it comes to testing. And some people, depending on which space you're in, depending on your use case, you're going to do testing differently. And you need to think about different things, like keep certain things in mind when you test. So, and not to mention, like there's a ton of different kinds of tests that you can do and which ones yeah. do you focus on? So, uh, yeah, but I think knows? I'm kind of of the opinion that like, just like in monitoring where we kind of, uh, thought we could do it automatically. And we found out that it's something that at least at this point in our, uh, in our platform, we have to have data scientists work on this as part of the process. Uh, I think it, we're at the, we're still at the point where it's the same for testing. Like we can't auto test something. Uh, I, I don't know like what we could auto test to have someone feel safer deploying a new model to production. Uh, like it, it's still something that people have to take responsibility for, uh, uh, at least currently on our team. Yeah, so I kind of want to zoom out here from the technology that kind of go back to the big picture. We've talked about some of the wins that you guys have experienced in terms of efficiency, right? We talked about some of the lessons you've had in terms of automation and its upsides and downsides with monitoring. We talked a little bit about what the future looks like in, in the sense that interfaces continue to be a a challenge that you're trying to think through from a platform vision. I want to go back to the mission statement that is in your bio that you as the team lead at, Le at, at Lemonade yeah. and the ML platform team writ large focus on development velocity, improving accuracy and promoting visibility into machine learning. How did you guys get such a clear mandate? And can you talk us through historically what that looked like? Was it sort of the CTO kind of saying, this is the way I want the ML platform to work? Or was it a little bit more dynamic? Like, how did you get to such a clear vision that's then translated into all these results? I definitely would say that it's dynamic. Um, I kind of want to, I want to say that uh, my, like the head of data science at Lemonade, I think he made a, good decision by bringing in engineering quite early in the like data science lifecycle at Lemonade and bringing dedicated engineering in quite early. Uh, so there was like a time where obviously Lemonade ran models and within the service and features were like sent to it automatically, like our first version of running machine learning at Lemonade. But then when, like I was the third person on the data science team. Uh, which wow. is, I think, yeah, that's quite early to bring in engineering. Uh, and I think that's like a decision that sort of paid off with building the team in general, uh, bringing in engineering uh, to like, I, I guess, look, to start with platform thinking early within the process. And then these are, I... these are goals uh, that have kind of uh, developed along the way. Uh, I, I mean, development velocity is like the biggest thing that's, it, it's very easy to state, but then, it, you know, improving accuracy is something that a platform can, can allow. And then visibility, both internally in the team and externally are pro priorities for us. So we want like data scientists to like, to be able to see what other people have done and we want model training to be democratized. So anyone can train anyone else's model with different hyperparameters. Uh, and then Can like externally you, uh, to the organization is also like something that's been uh, understood along the way that we kind of need to explain what we're doing organizationally. Uh, and the platform is maybe a place to start. 
I want to tell you just real fast. There's a quick funny story I have about the head of data science at Lemonade. I can't remember his name right now for the life of me. I, I was it's trying a, to... I, I, in English, it's Nathaniel, but it's not the that's yeah, it. in Hebrew. Yeah, that's it. So back in my dot science days when I was in sales, I reached out to him and like tried to sell him the dot science platform. And <laughs> I think I remember just asking something like, hey, we do this X, Y, and Z with dot science. You want more information? And he was like, yeah. I was like, oh my God, lemonade. The guy <laughs> said, yeah, ah, oh, this is amazing. And then he ghosted me for the rest of my time at dot science. So uh, I always, whenever I look at Lemonade, maybe I he hired me like guy. at the same time. Uh, CE. <laughs> that's yeah. probably it. Yeah, it was like yeah. 2019, was it? Yeah, yeah, that's when I started. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, it? man. I don't need Demetrius. I have Or now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, he made the better choice, to be honest. Dot Science went out of business. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But maybe problem, they wouldn't right? have gone out of business him, yeah. if Lemonade was a customer. Who knows? <laughs> I, I think a lot of people, going back to what you just said about you coming in early, I think a lot of companies struggle to embrace platform thinking early because they're not sure if they're ready for the expense and the investment. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's definitely one of those things that pays off long term, but you have to be committed to it. Uh, you yeah. can't pl pull the plug early. And I, I see that now at the company I'm at now where you know I have to advocate a lot for really thinking about we want to invest in our our limited time, energy, and resources into building a data platform that'll be really good in a year and not focus on like generating a bunch of one-off reports right now, you know, about different sort of analytics or insights questions. So it's, it's good to hear about a story where this does work. And I'm definitely going to send this podcast to my boss and say, Hey, <laughs> look what happens. Yeah, it kind of get... feels like this was in the culture though, right? Of lemonade already before you got there or I agree. Like platform thinking is something that's kind of big and uh, at Lemonade in general, but it, it is a gamble. Like you, you know, right. It, a premature opt optimization is like the, one of the evils of engineering. So. Yeah, that's true. I want to close with a quick question about your talk at apply conf, uh, mm -hmm. which I highly recommend. We're going to put it in the show notes. Everybody should check it out. It's just 10 minutes. Great great overview of how to engineer to real business problems. You had a quote, which is verbatim. If you're making online prediction, consider making the business point in time part of your machine learning platform. Can you quickly tell us what business point in time is and what it's allowed you to do and why you think other people should adopt it? Uh, yeah. So it, I'll start with the fact that it really depends on the product. Uh, so there will be companies with products that this is completely irrelevant for, and then companies where it may like hit a spot where, oh, this is perfect. Uh, so the business point in time is basically when you make most of your predictions. So we'll make a lot of predictions at Lemonade during like these specific times during uh, our business flow, like maybe when a user creates a quote or when they purchase a policy or when they make a claim. Uh, since we're an insurance company, I think it's quite easy to understand this flow. Uh, and then we kind of want to know how data looks during this, like this specific point in time, because that's when we're making predictions. So this is like a training data notion, uh, and creating training data for these very specific points in time, instead of like having this open way where data scientists can say where they want, like when they want data from for each data point and have it be like totally open and open to issues just as much as it's open to like, uh, to anything is something that we found uh, is just not needed. Like people don't need that at, at our company. They want to know how data looked when someone purchased a policy and that's all they want to know, like in most, most cases. And so providing this, uh, providing this data both allows us to like test it very well to make sure that it's uh, unified between training and inference. And then also to just, like minimize the amount of mistakes and the amount of uh, engineering that goes into making decisions because it's kind of only done once. Like people create data for this point in time. So I couldn't help but notice something there when you talked about this. And it felt like you got a little bit passionate when you started talking about the way that data scientists want their data or the, the different ways or the rainbow of choices that they have. 
what what uh what's behind that why are you so passionate about that <laughs> have you seen it go uh, the wrong way no i think it, this is like just how it sort of worked out organizationally organizationally at lemonade like this is what the customers have wanted and they were very adamant about it uh but i i mean i could totally see why some customers would want to be able to you know choose data from any time uh, it, it just kind of depends when you're making predictions. Like you have to sort of look at what's going on, like in most of the use cases. Amazing, man. This has been, it blew my expectations out of the water. I knew we were going to have a great chat, but I didn't realize it was going to be this good. I want to thank you for coming on here and just, uh, yeah, blowing my mind. Vishnu, as always, great time hanging out with you too. And yes, sir. that's about it. You got any final words, Vishnu? I mean, we're gonna, you know, take a second afterwards and and think all think about it and and come up with lots and lots of quotes, which we have from here. But you know, I think your emphasis on platform thinking, the lessons you shared with us, and the engineering quality at Lemonade really stand out. Or thanks a lot for joining us. And Thank you guys for having me. I really enjoyed it. Your team is hiring, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> there we go. If anybody isn't, is it in Israel only or? Uh, anywhere. Yeah, New currently York. for my team, we're hiring only in Tel Aviv. Okay, Tel Aviv. There are quite a few people in Israel in the community. So if you want to go work with Or and get some of this incredible way of looking at the ML platforms, hit them up. Uh, you're in the community Slack or just I imagine people can get a hold of you on LinkedIn and all that good stuff. Thank awesome. you guys.